Thank you. Uh, for an honor to speak at this very interesting conference. So, um, this is my outline. Uh, it, the talk is based on his papers, whose archive numbers are listed here. Um, so, one with Sergey, who just introduced me, and then uh, one, a couple of papers with Ryan Thorgren, who is now a grad student in Berkeley, and also some, some related work with uh, Nadia Cyborg. Um, so, I'll uh, first give some motivation, then uh, review. Uh, an old subject called diagram of Witten topological field theories, which is a very simple class of topological field theories defined in all dimensions. And then I'll uh, show how to, well, my goal is to generalize this to some, by replacing groups which appear in uh, diagram of Witten theories and input uh, with two groups. And I'll describe TQFT space in two groups and list some applications. Okay, so uh, motivation is to classify uh, what's called gapped phases of matter. So, so what are phases of matter? Well, you know, example, well, that, that's kind of states of matter which um, um, defined up to sort of homotopy. And uh, that is, you deform the Hamiltonian and nothing much changes, no, nothing, uh, qualitative, uh, nothing uh, qualitative changes. So say, uh, well, we can usually describe a phase by pointing out some particular you know, Hamiltonian or phase in this universality class. So there's liquid helium, or electron liquid and metals called fermiliquid, ferromagnets, insulators, superconductors, or a very interesting example is the vacuum of QCD. Now, phases, uh, well, the most rough classification of phases is into gapped phases and gapless phases. So if you look at the Hamiltonian, uh, quantum Hamiltonian of the phase, uh, then, uh, well, if you look at the finite volume, there's usually some ground state, and which is unique, and some excited states. Uh, and what, interesting to ask what happens in the limit of a large volume, and if in the limit of a large, large volume there's a unique vacuum, and uh, the first excited state is separated from the vacuum by a finite amount, even in an infinite volume, you say the phase is gapped. Now, uh, actually, most of the phases we're used to uh, are gapless uh, because they have these massless excitations, like phonons or photons or whatever. But there are some, uh, in, the, in this, in this uh, list of phases, there are some gapped ones too, like insulators are gapped. Superconductor, it's actually gapped. QCD vacuum is also gapped. Um, so, um, so as, as I just mentioned, you know, gapless excitations often arise when you have spontaneous breaking of continuous symmetry. But so I won't be interested in those phases. Now, um, well, I should also say that all phases of like quantum matter. Well, uh, so how to describe those? Well. Um, so basically, well, if you focus on gapped phases, then there is a belief that you can describe pretty much any uh, gapped phase using topological one quantum field theory, because basically like a limit of a quantum field theory when you rescale all distance, distance scales and time scales. Um, now, so, um, well, one uh, more concrete motivation was to classify possible phases of gauge theories. Uh, um, well, QCD is an example of a gauge theory. Uh, so I'd like to classify case phases of gauge theories using topological field theories. Now, and this is a well-known example. For example, ordinary superconductor um, is described by a topological gauge theory whose gauge group is Zimo2. Can I ask you a very stupid question? Yes. When you say it's described by TQFT, the, the Hilbert space of the TQFT, where does it sit? Yeah, actually, I'll, I think I mentioned in the next slide what, what the TQFT is good for, that what, what, is, what sort of things it captures. So. Now, it, it, it's often the case that this TQFT is, of, is trivial, uh, then uh, that sort of trivial phase. Like for ordinary insulators, it's trivial. Uh, but, but also, there are more in interesting examples. Like, say, there's something called topological insulators, which correspond to non-trivial TQFT. Uh, I won't actually say much about them, just there's some interesting new examples. And then there are some other uh, interesting gapped phases, like, uh, uh, say, fractional quantum hole phases, which are also described by non-trivial TQFT. So there are lots of uh, interesting quantum examples. Now, this is a, to address uh, Paul's question. So what, what is TQFT good for? Well, first of all, um, um, TQFT describes uh, long distance behavior of various correlators and some, some, uh, of, uh, some observables. And uh, some of these correlators actually become zero in the long distance limit if you rescale everything. Sort of, physicists say they sort of confined. But some do survive even if you take long distance limit. And those are described by topological field theory. Um, now, then, uh, if you look at, say, 
situation when you have a compact spatial slice, well, times time. So in that case, TQFT has a um, um, finite dimensional Hilbert space, and that finite dimensional Hilbert space is a space of vacuo of the original phase. So that's what it's good for in particular. So you can describe the vacuo. Well, although in, in some cases, you know, this vacuo, well, in, some, in many cases, this vacuum space is actually one-dimensional. So that's not, that's not the only use of TQFT, but it's one potential use. And probably one of the more interesting features is that TQFT tells us something about the behavior of the boundary of the phase. Sometimes a phase can be characterized by some interesting behavior on the boundary. And TQFT is, is good enough to capture that. Now let me review some uh, old stuff, namely uh, how to classify Higgs phases of gauge theories. That is where, well, sort of, well, superconductor is an example of that. Standard model is also like that. If you, well, at least part of the, it's not gapped, but uh, you know some of the things are gapped. Uh, and uh, well, what happens there is you have a condensate. In the vacuum is a complicated thing in this theories, and has a condensate of uh, electrically charged particles. And this is say there's a spontaneous breaking of gauge symmetry. Now, so you start with some. G0, which is a microscopic gauge group, but at long distances, all you see is some subgroup of G0 called G. So G0 is microscopic gauge group, and G is the low energy gauge group, which you can actually see. Now, if you want to have a gapped phase, then uh, G has to be finite, because if G says, if a broken gauge group is, um, um, well, it's typically some compact Lie group, but if it's uh, not a finite group, then you have photons, and, or, and then it's, it's, they're massless, and then, then uh, this on the gapped phase. Like standard model actually is not gapped because there are massless photons. But say, if you just forget about the, you know, the photons, then it just look at the glue, well, at some other particles, then it is gapped. Superconductor is gapped because the photon becomes massive there. Anyway, so the point is that low energy physics is described by gauge theory with gauge group G, which is finite. And then it doesn't even remember what G naught was. Um, now, um, so the path integral then in this topological field theory, which is just to sum over flat G connection, because I know other G connections, they're all flat. Uh, or G bundles are the same thing, principal G bundles. Now, interestingly, the, 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 there's more than one phase with these properties. Uh, like G, the, cho the, no, the, the choice of this gauge group doesn't fix uniquely your e equivalence class of a phase. Uh, so, what are po there is when you sum over flat connection, you can just you know, sum over all of them, or you can weight one. You can sum by some with some weights, and uh, consistent weights can be classified completely. So, is, you can classify all possible reasonable choices of weight, and they're classified by this. Uh, cohomology group of the classifying space of G. With D is dimension of space time. So, uh, so that was uh, actually explained first by Diagraph and Witten. Let me remind how it goes, how the argument goes, because, well, roughly the structure of the argument, because it, I'm going to generalize that. Now, first of all, uh, for every group, we have classifying space, and for finite G, one can just characterize it uh, up to homotopy equivalence by just by saying it's pi 1 is. Uh, G and higher homotopy groups are zero. Uh, say for, for Z2, like this space can be taken to be infinite projective space. And any G bundle is a pullback of universal G bundle over BG by some map. So instead of thinking about summing, well, over flat, or over G bundles, can think about summing over maps from the space to BG. So it's like a, you get like, your path integral is essentially like a sigma model with target BG. Um, and uh, path integral become a sum of these homotopy classes, and an obvious way to construct a weight in the path integral. Well, usually I, I write the weight as e to the two pi i times the e to the two pi i times the action called S, and then uh, the action can be obtained like this. You just have some map phi, so you can just take some cohomology class um, on BG of degree d, pull it back, and then integrate over the whole x. Uh, that's our weight, uh, and well, and uh, it takes well. It's cohomology values not in reals but in R mod Z because when exponentiate well multiply this S by two pi i and then exponentiate only the values of modular Z matter. So it's going to be cohomology class mod. So, so so this gives topological action reasonable topological action. Actually, actually is the only this describes all possible topological actions. Oh, but can one replace cohomology by uh, Bordisms here? Yeah, I'm ignoring that. Yeah. Actually, yeah, so actually in, in, in the, uh, the talk I gave it, Davis actually was mo most concerned with the version where you replace cohomology with cobordisms. That essentially you can ex exp understand part of that by doing that. Yeah. But here I'm going to focus on the simplified <coughs> uh, 
uh, version. So um, now uh, people often denote this group by like this, a group, group cohomology of, of G, but I don't use this notation because um, I'll be also using cohomology group of the iterated classifying space, like B squared G, and that doesn't have a special notation. So, uh, well, you see that, that well, it had, this B squared G is defined for abelian G only. So it's defined by saying that, you know, pi two is trivial, is G, and all other homotopy groups are, tri uh, are uh, trivial. So that is B squared G is the Eilenberg McLean space of type KG2. Anyway, so, so I'll just try it explicitly like this. A G, uh, co usual cohomology group is going to be written as cohomology of the classifying space. Now we need also slight generalization. You know, we have an abelian group A on which G acts. Uh, then there's an associated local system of groups over BG with fiber A. And its cohomology is noted uh, like this. So cohomology of BG with, with coefficients in A. So it's group cohomology of G with coefficients in A. Well, one can also give a very explicit description of this um, cohomology group uh, because there's a nice, for finite G, there's a nice uh, uh, d description, uh, well, this nice cell, uh, cell structure or for this BG. Uh, so in the, then one can describe it very, very explicitly as saying that, uh, well, an um, element of this cohomology group is a, a Dika cycle is some function uh, of d variables all living in this group G, and they which satisfy some constraint, the concycle condition, for example, for d equals 2 is like this. And then uh, there's some notion of cohomologous cocycles, and you, 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 you take a, a closed, you take cocycles modular, um, the ones which are cohomologically trivial, and then you get this cohomology group BG. Like, for example, uh, cohomologous co two cocycles that look like this, they differ by something by some expression like this, where h is some function of a single so variable. U1 carries the discrete topology. Sorry? Is R0z, does it carry the discrete topology? I don't really care here about topology. If I, g were not finite group, then I would. Uh, ah, okay, right. Sorry. Yeah. I actually don't really know how to work with the. It is interesting to consider the case when uh, g is not a finite group, and then topology is important. Yeah. Um, Okay, so anyway, so so how, so using this explicit well description of cocycles, one can, well, or cohomology classes as cocycles, uh, one can um, also give an explicit description of this diagraph within theory. So how to actually explicitly compute the partition function, well, or path integral. Well, first of all, you choose a, tri a triangle with your manifold, your, uh, manifold x, and um, a G bundle or flat G connection can be thought of as a uh, one cochain, uh, well, actually, one cocycle with values uh, in this group. So that is, you have an assignment of an element of a group to every one simplex, and this is with a constraint. So you sorry, yeah. constraint like that, uh, and you sum over uh, uh, these variables uh, with these constraints, uh, and the weight you assign to each constraint is simply sum over all d simplices, and each d simplice contributes this value of the, this cycle on, on this d, d elements, g1 to gd. So this whole construction looks like a lattice gauge theory. Uh, well, except it, well, there's a constraint for each two simplex. Um, in, the, in, the, in the abelian case, one can, for example, actually, in, in, instead of in putting these constraints by hand, one can enforce it using some additional uh, Lagrange multiplier field, which leads on two simplices. Um, OK, and, and the, the action has gauge invariance. Uh, it's an gauge invariant on the G gauge transformation. The gauge transformation is just a G valued function on zero simplices. Okay, so all, all very simple and very pedestrian. And well, so say in, in even dimensions, for example, well, it turns out that you look at cyclic group, then even dimensions cohomology group vanishes. So there's actually no interesting weights in even dimensions for group Zn, but uh, for three for, say for three dimensions, for example, there are non trivial weights even for such a simple group as Z mod n. And actually, in this dim dimension, abelian, the old diagraph theories with abelian gauge group are just special classes of abelian chern simon theories. But in, well, if you look, look at slightly more complicated groups, like products of cyclic groups, then uh, they're on trivial weights, even in uh, even dimensions. By the way, uh, yeah, so I actually don't know any um, interesting gauge theory with a non well, physically a reasonable gauge theory, which at long distance reduces to, say, in four dimensions, which long distance reduces to something like uh, well, with diagraph theory with a non-trivial 
cost a cycle. So I don't, embarrassingly, I don't know an example. Probably exist. Anyway, so what I'm going to do is uh, try to generalize this construction. Um, well, first of all, so diagraphic theories only care about you know g, connect, g, g bundles, so only care about pi one of x. Uh, and if you want to do something, detect some higher homotopy groups, well, we need gauge fields which are p forms, sort of, uh, with p greater than one. Uh, well, I'm, I'll focus on the case when the only p forms with p equals one, p equals two, sort of. Well, the usual gauge fields because one to p equals one, and these are like sort of two form gauge fields. And this was motivated by the relation with confinement. That's explained in detail with, in this paper with uh, Sergey, but I won't describe this motivation in any detail. Let me just explain the, the, how, uh, how I'm going to construct this. So first of all, so I'm going to have sort of one forms and uh, two forms gauge fields. Then also the gauge transformation, which live on both zero simplices and one simplices. Now, uh, what sort of structure do they form? Before I had a gauge group. And now I will need something called gauge to group. So let me explain what this is. Well, so um, the na natural approach is uh, like, uh, say, category theory. So you can think of a group as a category with one object and all arrows invertible. And physically, arrows describe symmetry transformations. Uh, or even more explicitly, as, uh, an arrow corresponds to an invertible co-dimension one topological defect localized in time. Defect along which you do the transformation. And composition of error just collision of these defects. You have like two hypersurfaces, you collide them, that corresponds to composition of errors. Now if you, uh, if you uh, well in, in quantum mechanics there is only, when there's only time dimension, co-dimension one is dimension zero. Uh, so there's nothing else you can really think about. But if you're in dimension greater than one, so if you have field theory than quantum mechanics, it can be, uh, um, well, it can be defects of higher co-dimension. So, for example, you can, you can start with this co-dimension one defects, which meet sort of perform symmetry transformations, but you can also, they can merge along co-dimension, meet along co-dimension two defects and intersign something to those co-dimension two defects. So uh, when you think about field theory, symmetries and field theory, it's kind of more natural to think about uh, sets of co-dimension one defects, co-dimension two defects, and so forth. If you just look at only co-dimension one and two defects, you, you end up with a uh, notion of a two group of symmetries, although in principle it could be also higher co-dimension guys. So anyway, so how do we encode, well, what, what is the structure that these guys form? Well, by analogy with the previous case, um, let's say uh, this sort of a two group of symmetries would be a two category with one object and invertible one arrows, and one arrows and two arrows. If you prefer, you can also think of a two group as a special kind of tensor category. Now, this, if this sounds a bit abstract, we can describe also completely explicitly what a two group looks like, uh, just in group theoretic terms. So, uh, so you have a pair of groups. Well, I won't explain precisely the relation with the previous definition, but the equivalent. So you have a pair of groups. Um, you have a homomorphism from one group to the other one and also an action of G on H, so homomorphism from G to automorphism of H. And plus there are some weird looking conditions, which it took me a while to memorize. So lots of parentheses. Um, uh, and, and this uh, quadruple is known as a crossed module. So it's some group theory thingy. It's equivalent to specifying this crossed module, same, same specifying uh, uh, two category with invertible well, with a single object and invertible um, arrows and two arrows. Now we can, uh, this definition is a bit defective in the sense that it's not really well defined as a set because um, two groups of different sizes can be equivalent as two categories. So it's convenient to, to focus on this sort of really physically important information, uh, well, or important information. And um, sort of a minimal model for a two group is obtained by identifying all isomorphic two arrows, or one arrow, sorry. This, and then this simplified data, or more concrete data, look as follows. You have a, first of all, you have this group G, and homomorphism from H to G. Well, so if you quotient G by image of this homomorphism, you're going to get some um, other group, because this image is actually normal, as it can, follows from those identities, obscure identities. So you have a, first of all, group pi 1. You have an abelian group pi 2, the kernel of this map. Uh, and again, it's abelian because of those identities. Have an action of pi one and pi two, 
And then finally, less obviously, there's also some element in degree three cohomology of pi one with values in pi two. So th this is the data which specify well, equally well described to group. So we have a, a group, a, a, an abelian group, an action of the non-abelian group on the abelian group, and then the element of this cohomology group. Okay, so and so we can use either this minimal model or those or the cross module. Either way, one, one can define the notion of a uh, two connection. Well, uh, so a two connection is basically a two form with values in well, locally. It looks like a two form with values in uh, the Lie algebra of this capital H, and also a one form with values in the Lie algebra of G. And then there are transition one forms and zero forms, and then there are transition zero forms and various compatibility conditions. So it's all kind of a bit complicated to describe. Um, but one can simplify life. In, well, uh, once life is one, if, the, uh, if this um, minimal model of the two group is finite. So then um, uh, really all information is contained in transition uh, zero forms on double and triple overlaps. And those take values in pi one, in this finite group pi one, and this abelian, finite abelian group, group pi two. With, and there's some constraint, of course. So um, one can further uh, simplify life by uh, picking some triangulation x, and then um, double overlaps are labeled by one simplices and triple overlaps by two simplices, and then a two connection is described by this pi one and pi two valued functions on one simplices and two simplices, with some constraints. And that's really what we want to, to formulate uh, this uh, higher analog of a diagram hidden theory based on a two group. Uh, so we have a triangulation, and we assume that we have this chosen this minimal model. Well, we have on this minimal model for the two group. That's two, two, a pair of groups, an action of pi one and pi two, and then hom uh, cohomology class, degree three cohomology class. Uh, so now, what is actual config? We're going to as in diagram hidden theory, we're going to sum over some configurations uh, of variables in, on, in, on triangulation. And each configuration contributes some weight. Let me first describe the configurations, which we sum over. Well, first of all, we have an element of pi 1 for any one simplex, just like in diagram hidden theory. But we also have an element of pi 2 for any two simplex. So there's, we have one k-chain uh, with values in pi 1 and two k-chain with values in pi 2. <coughs> and there are also constraints. And well, the constraint on A is very simple. It's just a one k-cycle, just like in diagram hidden theory. No difference. And the constraint on, pi, uh, on this two, uh, two uh, k chain is a bit trickier. Um, well, explicitly it looks as follows. So we have this, say, some, this is a constraint for every three simplex now. Um, and first of all, we have, have um, these pi one valued variables on each one simplex. And we also have a pi two valued variables on each uh, two simplex. I don't show them, so it, the picture doesn't look too messy. Uh, but there, there are four of them, right? Because, and I label them like this. So you have a phase opposite vertex, say, zero. I call the exponent variable B0. So this B0 lives on this uh, two simplex. And say B1 lives on the phase opposite to vertex one. So it lives here, and so forth. So and this is a constraint, uh, which this two, two k chain with values in pi two satisfies. Well, one can write in, in a more in a nicer form by recalling that, uh, is a, well, you know, since pi one x on pi two um, is a twist. Well, you can uh, on, on pi two valued k chains there is a you can define either ordinary differential or twisted differential, twisted by this gauge field A. And um, you can also think about A as a map to classifying space of, of pi one, and you can pull back that class base on the classifying space of pi one and get an element of pi 2. So, um, so we get then this um, um, configuration space. We have a closed one, uh, we have one cycle and the two k chain satisfying this twisted closedness constraint. So, um, um, okay, so I explained already what these constraints mean. Now I have to explain uh, the weights we assign to each configuration. Well, okay, so Weights must be satisfy some gauge invariant condition. So, what are gauge symmetries? Well, there's a uh, well. Uh, there is a 
the both sort of zero form gauge symmetries parameterized by a pi one valid function on zero simplices, which acts like this. And there are also one form gauge symmetries, which parameterized by a pi two valid function on one simplices, and they act like this. Well, the one complication compared to the usual case is that there are gauge symmetries between gauge symmetries. And they uh, lay parameters by pi two valid function on zero simplices. So when we construct the, the weight, we're supposed to, uh, well, make sure it's gauge invariant. And when you sum over all configurations, then in the end we divide by the group of all, by the order of the group of all gauge transformations. But that's over counting because there are also gauge symmetries between gauge symmetries. So we have to multiply by the order of the group of two gauge transformations. So what do the weights look like? Um, well, um, so the, 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 the weights are given again. Well, the, the, again, in the usual Dagger-Hutton case, it's convenient to reinterpret this two connection as a map from your our triangulation triangulated space X to some uh, classifying space. In this case, it's a classifying space of a two group instead of a group. So. Um, um, so the classifying space of a two group is some vibration. Uh, so its base is classifying space of the group pi one, and the fiber is the uh, iterated classifying space of the group pi two. And you know, one is fibered over the other in the way which is described by the remaining data of the two group. And then, but whatever it is, this has some cohomology in degree d, and you can define an action by just pulling back any class in degree d cohomology using this map phi, which encodes the gauge, well, the two two connection. Now, the, the, the interesting thing is actually, well, the interesting problem is how to actually compute this uh, cohomology. So for any given two group, how do we actually do this? So. Um, you use the set spectral sequence. Yeah, well, it's not, not so easy, yeah. So it doesn't, well, that's what we did back, basically, yeah. So um, in, the, in the paper, so, but I'm just saying that, the, well, the standard sort of resolution is a fine, fine for the classifying space of a group, but if you actually look at the, so this two group, the, you know, the standard resolution is huge even for very small groups. So you have like, in degree d, your cosine, your cochain depends on d variables in pi one and d times even one or two variables in pi two. So it, it's lots of variables. So there's no way to do anything this way. So um, actually, in the case pi one equals zero. The computation we were done completely like by Eisenberg and McLean in 1954. In this case, it seems very simple, but still not quite trivial. So you have just an abelian group pi two. There's nothing else, um, and you have this classifying space. Well, in this case, classifying space is just this iterated eisenberg mclean space b squared of pi two. So this is, this is the you know this is its homotopy groups, and then uh, well, well, one needs to compute its cohomology groups. And uh, you know if you look at eisenberg mclean you know you can find the computations and in, in low dimensions they look uh, as follows. So in degree two, there's just homomorphism, so it's just the dual of pi two. In degree three, there's nothing. In degree four, you have quadratic u one valid functions on pi two. So the first non-trivial case, really, in this case, is the degree uh, dimension four. So there's nothing interesting until then. Now, if you look at uh, more general. Uh, two groups with both pi one and pi two non-trivial, uh, it becomes uh, a bit more complicated. Well, but um, so the, well, let me define. Well, let me explain, explain what it looks like roughly. So we have um, if we can think about um, well, define these homomorphisms um, obtained by wedging um, with class beta. So it increases degree well by three. So you can think of it as a map from x uh, in the uh, well, this is x in pi one modules. So this is a pi one module that's also a trivial pi one module. So you get a sex group, and then by wedging with beta, you get an element here. So, um, so say in degree in dimension two, this cohomology group is just the kernel of this map. Um, so this, in other words, you know, this just uh, if you look at you know, characters of pi two. You just look at that, first of all the one which are invariant under the action of pi one and pi two, and then you also need want them to to be analyzed by the class, class beta. So that that's what the homology in degree two looks like. So well, in degree three, well, it's uh, actually well, it's some short exact sequence, but actually it splits, and you get this um, identification. And degree four, you get again similar things. So well, there's some 
three pieces actually, and the last one is just pi one invariant part. Well, this this is just quadratic function of pi two with u one value than u one, and just look at pi one invariant part. Is this the E two page or a later page? This is a later page. Do you know which one? Uh, I don't remember. <laughs> I think it's E three, but. Uh, Um, now, so this, um, well, in, so that defines a theory, a topological field theory, which depends on a two group and uh, this cohomology class and its classifying space. Now I can ask, okay, what, what actually, uh, well, what sort of properties does it have? Well, so it's in general pretty complicated, but w w one thing one can describe is, for example, observables in this theory. So, so if you look at, um, um, so in diagraph Pitton theory, the natural classes of observables are so-called Wilson loops, which are labeled by representations of the group G. And there are some uh, sort of dual of var variables um, um, which uh, corresponds to conjugate classes on G. Now, uh, let me describe similar things for this two-group theory, say, in dimension four, because it's kind of an interest physically interesting case. Uh, well, again, there are loops, which are labeled by representations of pi one, like Wilson loops. But also a different kind of loops with labeled by elements of pi two, um, and um, and then there are two kinds of well, in, sorry, uh, in diagraph Witten theory you would have you would have just sort of surface observables observables localized on two-dimensional submanifolds. So here you have two kinds of loops, so there are two kinds of surface observables. First of all, like in diagraph Witten theory, there are uh, magnetic sort of surfaces labeled by conjugate classes in pi one, uh, but they also sort of so these guys are dual to th these guys. But then there are also uh, sort of a different class of surface operators labeled by a special, well, it's a bit complicated. So uh, they're labeled by elements um, of this cohomology uh, group simply because um, the way you do it, you know, you, you start with the uh, two connection and if you want to define this uh, electric surface observable, just restrict this two connection on your surface and then uh, you need sort of pick some class here, then integrate over this uh, surface. So the answer is given by this cohomology group, or explicitly is given by this, as explained before, by, by this um, uh, alpha invariant characters analyzed by this class beta. I'm just what, I'm a bit confused. So you have a, a sub-manifold of your four-dimensional yeah. space-time, and you're taking a cohomology class mm -hmm. on BG, which yeah. is of that degree, yeah. you're pulling it back and yeah. integrating. All of these are of that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but it's actually not the most general observable, again, because like if I did a similar thing for, say, Wilson loops, I would only get uh, sort of one-dimensional representations of the group. So really what I should do, I should, uh, um, when I have a surface, I need to, well, when I have a one-dimensional submanifold, uh, when I should representation, essentially I'm putting a one-dimensional field theory, uh, which sort of can interact with the, uh, higher dimensional diagraph Witten theory in the ambient space. So here, to become in general, I would have to uh, choose, a, when I have a surface, two-dimensional surface in my four-dimensional space, I would have to choose a two-dimensional topological field theory somehow couples to this two connection. But that's kind of difficult to describe. I'm not sure how to classify such things. It needs extra work, so I decided not to do it, just sort of look at the sim simplified class of observables, which are just analogs of one-dimensional representations of G. Okay, so this very explicit description of a class of topological field theories defined in every dimension, which depend on a two group and some cohomology class. So what are they good for? Um, well, um, basically, uh, so in this uh, paper with Sergey, we propose that this kind of theories describe a gapped phase, which uh, exhibit both confinement and Higgs, Higgs effect. So. So Higgs effect arises when you have some, when sort of electrically charged particles are present in the vacuum, sort of a condensate, and they break um, uh, uh, the gauge group down to a subgroup. Uh, what about confinement? Well, confinement arises from a condensate of magnetically charged objects. Say, in, in four dimensions, just again, particles, sort of monopoles, but in higher dimensions, there will maybe some strings, say, and so forth. They, are, you, they all always could dimension, could dimension two. So, um, so what's the interpretation of this data in physical terms then? So it's a crossed module, so what is G and what is H? Well, first of all, G is a subgroup of the UV group, or the microscopic gauge group, which is not Higgsed, sort of this unbroken part. And now the, this map, this from H to G arises in the following way. So 
its image is the confined subgroup of G. It's always normal. So the, the, the co-kernel the co is actually the effective long distance gauge group. Uh, and that's actually the way, that's why it's not really, uh, why, that's why this a, a G is not really physical. You know, because the, the important thing is what happens at long distances. And if part of the G is confined, all you see is uh, the, you know, the unconfined part of the gauge group. So this pi 1, the kernel, is all you see really at long distances. On the other hand, the kernel of this map labels magnetic fluxes of at hoof loops which have not been confined. You see, so when you have a Higgs effect, then in general, at hoofed, these magnetic loop operators, they, 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 they sort of get confined. They don't survive at long distances, and the kernel is precisely labels those which do, are, 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 do survive. Okay? So that's why the uh, pi 1 and pi 2 are date of the low long distance topological field theory. Now, the, the, the agar theory theory just corresponds to a special case when nothing is confined, it's just, just Higgs effect, nothing else. But uh, in general, when both Higgs and confinement operate, you need, we need to use this kind of two group TQFT. So, um, now, um, there's another, so, so that's one um, application of these two group topological field theories. So, um, one can use it to describe um, phases of like QCD like theories. Uh, but there's another rather different application motivated by um, uh, condensed matter applications. So, um, now uh, recently, the topic which has been very prominent in uh, condensed matter physics is symmetry protected topological phases. So, what's that? Well, um, these are phases of matter um, which are gapped and have short range interactions only uh, and have some fixed global symmetry G. Now, it is further assumed it's a global symmetry, not a gauge symmetry, so there are no G gauge fields. However, it's further assumed that it's sort of on site symmetry, it acts on every, only on variable, doesn't make variable, variables living on different zero simplices, it just acts on each zero simplex separately. Uh, so, um, so the, on each zero simplex, there are degrees of freedom, and then G acts separately on each of them. So in such a situation, um, well, OK. So we would like to classify such phases of matter up to homotopy, up to deformations of the Hamiltonian or the action which preserve all these properties, like gaplessness. Oh, sorry, gap. The, the fact that there's a gap and the fact that there's a G symmetry. Now, so it's not at all obvious that there are non-trivial, that, can, well, that cannot always deform such a thing into, um, um, into a um, into a trivial uh, theory. Actually, sorry, I forgot one other thing. Um, no, sorry, I forgot one, one more condition, actually. So I, I mentioned before that if you look at space time, uh, at spatial slice of a general topology, in general, the vacuum is degenerate. So you have a non-trivial, non, non uh, non, the space of a vacuum is not one-dimensional. And that's usually where topological field theory appears. Uh, well, actually, if you just try to classify all uh, phases with this symmetry G and such prop in general degeneracy of a ground state, and that's completely unmanageable. That's like, it's worse than classifying topological field theories, which you still don't know how to do. So let's look at the sim simpler case when this, there's no vacuum degeneracy. So, so topological field theory would be trivial. However, you still have this uh, symmetry G, which you need to take into account somehow. Um, so this problem actually is manageable. So, and phases of lattice models, uh, which belong to such classes, are called symmetry protected, protected topological phases. So they have property that they're gapped. The, you know, the spectrum of Hamiltonian is gapped. They uh, have a symmetry, and um, uh, the, there's no vacuum degeneracy on, their, on any spatial slice. So how do we classify such things? Well, first, the, the main observation is that, you know, since we assume that the, the uh, G symmetry, the symmetry G acts separately on degrees of freedom, um, on every um, site, well, it's kind of easy to see that in this case there's no obstruction to gauging. It's, there's allowing different gauge sim uh, transformation on different sites, so there's no, no obstruction. Now, of course, if you, essentially it's promoting a, your global G symmetry G to a gauge symmetry. Uh, well, if, mathematically, you know, start say that you know your G transformation is now general zero co-chain with values in G. Essentially, what it means is that you, there's a way to couple your system to a flat. A gauge field with structure group G. Now, uh, in this case, well, and uh, that doesn't change the fact that there's a new ground state, therefore one can sort of perform the path integral, uh, integrate out all these degrees of freedom and get some effective action for this G gauge field. 
and the action at long distances must be topological because the system is gap must be topological. So that's a naive argument. Of course, it doesn't. Uh, it's actually it's, it's actually very hand waving. But if you believe this argument, then to every phase like this, one can assign an element of this uh, homology group, which classifies topological gauge theories with symmetry, gauge symmetry G. So that's known as uh, group cohomology classification of SPT phases, and it seems to work very well. So uh, indeed, the uh, all known phases are classified well, with symmetry G classified by such cohomology groups. Uh, well, there's some physically also the case when G is a Lie group, also interesting one. Uh, then look at uh, BG, where G is regarded as a discrete group. So, so it's, 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 it's subtle then. You need to f specify which cochains you're considering. Anyway, so what I would like to propose is there's some generalization of the story. Uh, in the case um, uh, when um, when you have also a global sort of one form one form symmetry, so one form symmetry is a symmetry well, which is uh, well, just like a global zero form symmetry, a symmetry which is uh, given by a closed zero cochain. Uh, well, a global one form symmetry is a Symmetry parameters, transformation parameters by closed one cochain. There's a function one synthesis, satisfying the closeness constraint, and with value in some abelian group H. And uh, when you gauge such a thing, you basically, first of all, you relax this, well, you don't require this one cochain to be closed anymore. But then you also, to make the, the, the action, to make the action invariant under the symmetries, you also need to introduce a two form gauge fields. So um, that is. H valued field which lives uh, in on uh, two simplices. And um, so we propose that this um, symmetry, such uh, sort of one form symmetries, global one form symmetry, give rise to, to new classes of, of this symmetry protected topological phases. They're protected by two symmetry instead of the ordinary symmetry. So, uh, and then by the same, same argument tells you, well, when you can, you can integrate everything out and you're going to get some effective action for this two form gauge field, and we know what they're labeled by. They're labeled by this cohomology group of the iterated classifying space. Um, now, so this, well, as I explained, this becomes really non-trivial only in dimension four or greater. So these new SPT phases really arise in dimension four or greater. Um, now, there, there are actually some examples of this um, in our paper with uh, uh, Cyborg, in particular, we uh, give some examples of um, such um, uh, theories, which have uh, uh, which are some massive phases of matter, which have this global one-form symmetry and, and non-trivial, even non-trivial class. Uh, well, in, well, this class which is here for them turns out to be non-trivial, and, and as a result. Uh, uh, on the boundary, there's some non-trivial behavior. Like there's some, uh, well, on the boundary, have must have a, say, chern simons theory. Uh, let me just make a few more uh, concluding remarks. So first of all, in principle, well, I just explained um, that you know, how, how to use this uh, one-form symmetries to define new uh, symmetry protect, protect, protected topological phases, but in principle, you know that that's just a special case of a symmetry. You know, in general, you know, we have a non-trivial. You might have two groups playing a role, where there are some tra transformations which leave in both zero simplices and one simplices. So they probably lead to more SPT phases, but I'm not really sure how to construct any examples like that. Um, and, and even more generally, if you in D dimensions, symmetries should really be described by D group. In, if in D dimensions, space and dimensions. Uh, your symmetry group is, should be really thought of as a D group. And these uh, D groups, which are basically D categories with one object and all arrows and you know, iterated arrows and vertebrals, should lead to even more phases of matter. Um, and well, I'm not, I'm, I don't have, know any examples like that, so I won't discuss them. And finally, well, if you come back to this, well, uh, to this two group gauge theories on the Quantum level, so for, for SPT phases, the important thing is the classical action of this two group TQFT because you're just studying the, how the action depends on the background gauge field. They're not, they're not integrating over the, uh, the gauge field. But if you think about this two group gauge theory, which is described as a quantum theory, then 
can ask, well, maybe, maybe they're not really new, and maybe they're related to the known ones, like dagger Witten theories, by some dualities. Now, in some cases, that's actually true. So if you can look at the paper and you see that, you know, if your cohomology class on this classifying space is sufficiently simple, you can actually dualize um, your, your theory to an ordinary dagger Witten theory. Uh, but in general, that's not true. So um, in general, a new, this is a new class of topological field theories, and it were to be studied also in higher dimensions because um, uh, they, um, uh, well, they might have interesting, for example, boundary behaviors, which um, can be speculated to be related, say, to, um, uh, say, uh, chiral theories in six dimensions, which have been so mysterious. So I'll stop here. Uh, this is sort of a strange question, but can one use these things to to create quantum computers? <laughs> well, uh, if you can make a, let's see. So in principle, yes, it's just usually people prefer to work with fermionic symmetry practical topological phases. They're sort of more easily constructed in the lab. Still very hard, though. Not, not how it constructed, but it's more realistic. So in general, um, um, in practice, you, well, this this uh, sort of field theories appear from, um, or SPT phases rather, appear from when you assume that your basic building models are bosons with some symmetries which geon acts on them. So in practice, it's actually very hard to, to come up with any. How do you make four dimensional matter? It's three plus one dimensional. Oh, right? really? Yeah, it is nothing. It actually works in. No, when I say four dimensional, it's space time with dimension four. It's actually our physical dimension. So, uh, so dimension. yeah, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. So, so. One can do that, and one can, in principle, just post a sufficiently complicated two group, and then you'll have some quantum computer. <laughs> but in practice, there's no way. I don't actually know of any physical, a reasonable physical system which gives rise to, say, dagger within theory with some non trivial, especially with an abelian group. The abelian ones are typically boring. So if you want an abelian gauge group and non trivial cohomology class, that's it. I don't actually know any way to construct that. So there are other. Uh, well, variations of, of this stuff using fermions are more promising because uh, it's actually more promising. Well, it's, it's clearer how to construct phases uh, with interesting uh, class. In this case, some proper, well, actually, for fermions, you need to use some spin cobordism instead of cohomology of the classifying space. But anyway, so it's easier to imagine how to construct such phases out of fermions and out of bosons. In that sense, they're useful. What's the stuff you're using at arbitrary with the finite homotopy type as opposed to this homotopy P type? Well, nothing stopping me, just easier to find physical realizations. Yeah, so, if you look at general homotopy type, I just don't know any way to physically realize this topological field theory, that's all. But are there any sort of physical guidelines to think about homotopy types? So, sorry, is there a something? The other direction. So suppose we know something about physical, physical meaning of those things. Can we conclude something about how the types? So maybe there is some kind of organizing principle. Well, I, okay. So I don't really. Okay. For me, this um, the space whose homotopy type I'm using to construct a field theory doesn't really have any physical meaning. Like I take homotopy two type. I don't really know what I wouldn't know what to do with the space itself, which has this two homotopy ah, type. Okay, so so in some sense, well, actually, Kitayev was uh, selling me on an idea that you know, symmetry should really be, you know, you should forget about symmetries, just replace symmetries with actual spaces yes. or homotopy types, right? Turayev. Yeah, that's, that's Turayev's yeah. idea. OK, maybe it's Turayev's idea, too. But uh, in practice, I don't really see how, okay. how useful this, this would be. I mean, physically, I don't see any space around with this homotopy type. Can you comment about the Pietzelberg function? Well, three. Pietzelberg function. And and Anderson, look at this. Anderson. I mean, you, in the first, I mean, start of the talk, you mentioned about the, you mentioned about quantum, like spin quantum, I think this setup. Uh, did I mention spin quantum? I didn't. I don't think I did actually. I, I didn't mean spin quantum Hall effect. I just mentioned the fractional quantum Hall effect. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Well, this it, it is not. This is not relevant, really. Um, 
So, so topological field theory, which is responsible for fractional quantum, fractional quantum Hall effects, are a different kind of field theory. They're like Chern Simons theories, which cannot be written as um, uh, finite sums over some finite sets on triangulation. They, and the, the reason they are, they're not really topological field theories is because they have, they have framed topological field theories, a framing anomaly. These theories don't have any framing anomalies in any dimension, so they're a bit different. Yeah, and I don't I'm not sure why Chern Simons theory. There's not like Chern Simons theories. They are, they are, uh, yeah, there is like a, a higher Chern Simons theory too, like in five dimensions. These are not the theories I'm talking about. They're like, well, first of all, you didn't get to five dimensions. Uh, <laughs> but uh, these things only make sense. For, they're like the analogs, like a finite Chern Simons theory, rather than of normal Chern Simons theory. So they are not related to higher dimensional analogs of uh, fractional quantum Hall states. So, so in, in your, one of your slides appears that the group is discrete uh, topology. So this appears in uh, Fourierian theory. So would it be possible to imagine this as a Fourierian space, where you, you can travel in the space, but cross the leaves is more punished than go along the leaves? I don't think I can comment on that. All I know is that. Uh, uh, okay. So, so there will be a very invariant, this uh, typical class which appears in, in the three cohomology, in that case, of U1. Uh, well, that class, of course, okay. So that class does a, plays an important role. That's the simplest. It's like just usual Chern Simons action corresponds to that, actually. So, so this so, corresponds to a Yeah, right. Okay, fine. Yeah, so this class is. The classes uh, like that just turn Simon's classes. So, so in that, so I'm not sure how to interpret them geometrically. It's just a sort of thing. Fourier, I think. Okay. okay. When we replace uh, the T group of symmetries uh, by its uh, homotopy type, don't we just get back to the standard sigma model? Well, it is basically, well, okay, so I'm just saying this is, for, for me, it's just formal construction. Like, I don't see any, well, the sigma model is not really physical. It's some infinite dimensional space as a target. So it's for me, just a trick to compute, to partition, well, to, 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 to figure out what possible weights are. Uh, like, in, in, in physics, even in the graph case, you don't really see a classifying space anywhere. Uh, right, you basically treat it as a point modeled up by the final group. Yeah. All right, so there are lots of questions about quantum computers, validations. Let's talk about this over coffee and thank Anthony.